Take me out to the ball game Take me out with the crowd Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks And I don't care if I ever get back Cause it's root, root, root for the whole team They don't know it, it's a shame Cause it's one, two, three strikes You're out at the Welcome to Let's Get Two, the baseball podcast from the fans' perspective. Now here's your host, James Christopher. And welcome to Let's Get Two. I am your host, James Christopher, and we have a great episode for you today. We're going to be talking to the Martha's Vineyard Sharks, and those of you who know me know how I earn a living. Yes, that's right. Uh, Martha's Vineyard, where the movie Jaws was shot. Uh, So we love the fact that there's the Martha's Vineyard Sharks and we have a great time talking to them today. Andrew Nelson is back. And as we get ready for next week, which will be our hundredth episode, he went ahead and did a countdown of some of the biggest moments in baseball history from 100 years ago, from 1920. And it sounds like it was just as crazy then as it is now. But we have a fun episode for you today, like I said. but. You know, I want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus, and we haven't talked about it much uh, lately because, honestly, uh, people are tired of hearing about it. And I really do kind of pride myself on this being a show that you can go to that kind of gives you a break from some of that real world stuff. But the thing is, you guys, is that COVID is real, and I understand that. On both sides of the political spectrum, there has been politis- politicization, politicization, politicalization. I'm a really smart guy. It's been politicized a bunch. There's no way to deny that. There's no way to not see that when you look at how the story's been covered. But the reality is that it is a virus that is highly contagious, that Maybe not as lethal to people 40 and younger, but people that are high risk or older can absolutely be lethal and also will have long term effects that we really don't know what those effects will be. Uh, Those are things that can't be denied. I know that they can be denied. Those are things that shouldn't be denied. And one of the things that's been frustrating for me is how Major League Baseball has reacted to the coronavirus, when you look at how other leagues are planning, you look at the pods in the NBA, the pods in the NHL. Uh, I was listening to a story today on AM 610 out of Houston talking about the the protocols of like people wearing tracking devices at training camp for the NFL. So that way if something comes up, they can contact Trace immediately. In Major League Baseball, yeah, we trust everyone. The fact that, and look, I'm going to be honest, uh, you know, if you look at the Joe Kelly, Carlos Correa situation, Correa is the one who walks to the Dodgers dugout. And he does, in fact, incite the, the group of people to gather around. The fact that Correa, because of COVID-19, didn't face any kind of discipline seems weird and counterintuitive to what We know about the virus, just like the idea that Loriano got very few games, I guess eight, and it'll probably get reduced for also inciting a lack of social distancing due to COVID-19. But in the ultimate hold my beer moment, it's time to talk about one of my least favorite Major League Baseball players to ever wear a, a uniform, Mike Clevenger. The Mitch Kramer of the MLB. Mitchy, 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 Mitchy. Um, He who famously threw his wife out like on social media, whatever. Mitch, uh, Mike Clevenger needs to not be allowed to play baseball for the rest of the year. And And the fact that you've seen his teammates come out hard on him, as hard as they have been, has really been telling. Here's the thing. Those of you who don't know, and this is the story to the best of my recollection, is that Mike... Also snuck out with with another Indians pitcher, Plesak. Denied being out 
got on a plane with his team, including Carlos Carrasco, who it did survive. You know, it was this it was the heart story of the year last year in Major League Baseball. Uh, did survive leukemia, only to then have been found out that he was in fact out. He could have infected his entire teammates. And what did he get? He got placed on this restriction list for 14 days with pay. Major League Baseball either cares about COVID-19 or they don't. And there is no middle ground. And I would just rather, like everything else that Rob Manfrod in, has has managed to mess up, and, and he, he's bringing baseball fans together because everyone thinks he's bad. The Astros fans think he's bad. The Dodgers fans think he's bad. Yankee fan thinks he's bad. No one cares what Marlins fans think. Kidding. Either we care or we don't. And right now, all the evidence is to the we don't really care, that it is all lip service and that, you know, it is going to be players who are going to have to take it upon themselves to in- enforce these restrictions and make sure that they're doing the right thing. But to me, there is no way if this had happened to a member of the Houston squad, I would absolutely be saying the thing, the same thing. He should not be allowed to play baseball for the rest of the year. He should not be getting paid. He willfully, after being the guy who stood on the soapbox about how important this all was and how we all supposed to take it seriously, you know, and he does that. He's got this like, um, and it's why I don't like him. I I, I don't like him because his opinions are different than me. I don't like him because his parent, his opinions are smug and all over the place. And he acts with this sort of moral superiority. And then he goes and does this and, and, you know, the fact is, is he's a child. He doesn't know really about stakes or cost in life yet. You know, if one of his teammates gets sick, he's never going to live with that for the rest of his life. He's always going to think about that. And and so, you know, if I'm the Indians, I, I hope that they are going to do something to discipline him. It is, um, if you don't, if you don't, you are empowering those people who already thinks this virus is a hoax to continue to think and, and now get rooted in their opinions that this virus is something we don't need to be taking seriously. And that's not just dangerous for the Indians or the teams that they play against or even just the Major League Baseball as an industry. It's dangerous to everyone. Because whether they should or shouldn't, and I'm on record as they shouldn't, look people whether people should or shouldn't look up to athletes – They do. And they see that Major League Baseball, on one hand, making all this lip service about how we've got to be tough. We're going to cancel the season. And then someone takes such an egregious action to endanger his whole team and then lies about it, which is the best part of the whole story. He lies about it and then gets caught. You can't have that. That can't be allowed to exist. But, um, you know, that's 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 the low point of the episode. Stay with us. We have a lot of fun coming up. Lights, camera, play ball inside baseball cinema. I want to talk a little bit about a little scene because it really wasn't given much of a chance by the network television show called Back in the Game. So it was created by Mark and Rob Cullen. It starred Maggie Lawson from Psych, James Kahn from everything that's good and Benjamin Koldyke. So the premise of the show is, is that Maggie Lawson plays a former high school baseball pitcher turned collegiate softball athlete who, after a bad divorce is forced to move back home with her father, James Kahn with her son. And she ends up becoming the coach of a group of misfits who weren't picked to play in little league. And I thought the show was great, and I think uh, it was maybe a little bit ahead of its time. It was um, topical. It dealt with inclusion and race relax- race relations and sexual orientation and all of these things that um, are very, very topical today. It had a certain raunchy sensibility with James Kahn's character, and one of the things I really liked about it is how it was shot. It was a single-camera sitcom at a time when those still weren't necessarily ubiquitous. And I think lots of those things are why the network essentially gave up on it and kind of didn't give it a chance to find an audience on streaming because, again, streaming also was not ubiquitous. And I get credit for using the word ubiquitous twice. 
But, you know, I ended up uh, rewatching it over quarantine. I watched it as it came um, and then forgot how many episodes there were and was really just heartbroken when the show ended. But the strength is in the characters and it's in the acting. Maggie Lawson, I am a big fan. Psych is my all-time favorite show, and she takes some of the same ele- elements that make up Juliet's character. She is um, powerful. She's a strong woman. She has her own, her own focus, her own drive. She really commands the scenes when she's in them. In Psych. Juliet is kind of the only adult in the room. And so as a result, she doesn't get as much anxiety, I guess, as much angst to deal with, right? Like Juliet, when, when Sean's around, Gus is around, and even Carlton's around, she has to be the grown up. She has to be the straight person, straight person in the comedic sense of the word. With back in the game, she gets to take some of those same elements, strength, um, determination. She's, you know, a, a, a single mother raising a son in a game that is very male dominated. But she gets to have a little bit of pathos with that because she is dealing with a bad divorce and her own issues with her dad, who um, she doesn't really want to understand all the time. And she gets to do all of these. The She gets to have these moments where she doesn't. You know, she questions, did she lose her her sense of being a woman in this when she became a mother? And all of those things get to be dealt with by an actor who is extremely talented and is extremely accessible in her performance. James Kahn is great in the sh- in the show as well. He gets to uh, be we can almost look like what if Sonny didn't die in the in the toll booth and then ended up a failed ball player because he's got some of that same um you don't be the hothead sunny edge to him. Well, at the same time, we get a little bit of heart and there's a softness to him. And I think one of the most powerful moments in the show is, you know, it's early on in the series, in the season when when Maggie Lawson's character, they moved back home. And they're kind of all living on top of each other. And it's because James Kahn, his character, has left the master bedroom untouched since his wife died. And it had been years. And you get little glimpses of humanity buried underneath that very gruff, very harsh exterior. And it really had the show been allowed to continue. I think we would have seen a lot of great stuff from James Kahn in that sense. The depth of the writing really shines through when it comes to Benjamin Goldike's character, and I'm probably pronouncing his name, but he plays on the surface that very small person who gets to have a big job and gets to therefore dominate the people around him. He is very much that uber jock, and he's kind of a prick, and he talks about all the women that he sleeps with, and and it's done as a way to try to court uh, Maggie Lawson's character, and at the same time, um, you know... She completely refuses his advances because she's done that before. But then again, there are moments where it is him overcompensating for having been heartbroken in himself. And movies and shows work when characters pop. And I think had the show been allowed to continue, we would have gotten a lot of really interesting character studies about what it is like to, you know, be a woman trying to survive in an ultimately a man's world. And then on the other, and then getting to see James Kahn's character, let, let his guard down or let Benjamin's character learn to be open to the fact that he's kind of a chauvinist and that's not working for him. But in every comedy, you have to have comedy. And a lot of that comes from both Lenora Chiklo's character, who is sort of the boozy best friend of Maggie Lawson, who, you know, she's very rich. She's, she's, and she gets a lot to, she gets to be the comic relief in a lot of ways. The other strength of the show is the casting of the kids. And there are a lot of different ethnicities going. There's a lot of diff, there's a couple of different orientations going, but all of the kids rise to the occasion. And in a show like this, if the kids can't act, then the show is going to fall apart. And, you know, if you look at a show like Modern Family, that is what worked is that those kids, for the most part, grew into being good actors. It's the same thing for Back in the Game. All the kids, are they rise to the occasion. So I do hope you give the show a chance. It, it's a show that it just felt like the network gave up on because it didn't really understand where were we heading with entertainment with the idea that things were going to be streamed later on after release. You know, and it reminded me of Parks and Rec, which was 
obviously a very different show, but also was a show that the networks gave up on several times. And there were several times when there was a rumor of it being canceled only to get it revived because of fan reaction. And I think that's just, I think the network was short-sighted. I think if the show had been allowed to run for three or four seasons, we've got a lot of, lot of interesting character development and, and it would have been fun to see more baseball. So highly recommend checking out Back in the Game. Raiders of the Lost Diamond, a look into baseball's past. So we're here on the Raiders of the Lost Diamond and Andrew Nelson is back on it. And, you know, the show has its hundredth episode next week. And you and I cooked up some fun to kind of lead into anniversary week. Well, we kicked up an idea of fun. You did all the work. I'll just take half the credit. Uh, what did we come up with? Well, for uh, for the hundredth episode of Let's Get Two, we're going to do something a little bit different with Raiders of the Lost Diamond. Uh, rather than covering a specific specific team from yesteryear, we're going to look back at baseball a hundred years ago in nineteen twenty. Okay. So uh, we find ourselves living in interesting times, as they say, and uh, nineteen twenty was also pretty interesting times. Uh, World War One and the global influenza pandemic were just in the rearview window. And in the U.S., uh, prohibition and women's suffrage were ratified as constitutional amendments. Uh, the ACLU, the League of Women Voters, and the NFL formed. Wall Street was bombed, and Sacco and Vanzetti, two um, Italian anarchists, were put on trial for a, an armed robbery and a murder that they probably didn't commit. Whoa, whoa. Wall Street was bombed like by, by terrorists? Or, yeah, or some anarchists the equivalent it was. Bombed, uh, bombed Wall Street, killed like 31 people, and injured 200 some. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Wow. Um, and uh, Warren G. Harding was elected president. And the U.S. Postal Service started mail sur- uh, air mail service between New York and San Francisco and also forbade the mailing of children by parcel post. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to find out, you know, and that, that dives, what was that weird uh, conspiracy theory we had where that furniture company was like packing kids? I can't say I'm familiar with that one, but if you yeah, look up uh, pictures of, of children being sent by parcel post, it's pretty wild. There's literally like mailmen with, with like toddlers with stamps on their heads. It's, it's something else. So. <laughs> 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 On to baseball. Sorry, I got to move the cat. Was that the cat? Was that the cat cameo? I love it. That was the cat's tail. That was Bowie. He he has to be the center of attention. Yeah. So 1920 was also a tumultuous and transformative year for baseball. Uh, In January, the major league owners agreed to draft players from the minor leagues in reverse order of the standings from the previous year. So fairly similar to the modern arrangement. <clears throat> so they used to do it. Did they used to do it where the best team got the first pick? Is that how that went? Uh, you, I didn't investigate further. Unfortunately. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Uh, they also agreed to outlaw any pitches that uh, involved doctoring the ball in any way. So uh, oh. pitchers used to like literally, um, you know, cut the ball and, and things like that. Uh, couldn't do that anymore. Starting in 1920. And in, in February, of course, lots of people know the Negro National League was formed in Kansas City, spearheaded by Reuben Foster. Right. Uh, the eight-team league, eight league would begin their season on May 2nd. And in October, the Black Sox scandal exploded with eight players from the Chicago White Sox being indicted for fixing the 1919 World Series. Now, that's Follow- what's interesting, though, because uh, – sorry to cut you off, but – No, no problem. Um you know, we talked, we had D.B. Sweeney on not long mm-hmm. ago, and he pointed out the fact that the movie makes it look like all that happened in in a, in a manner of weeks. But you're saying right. they fixed the 19 and that didn't get busted up until the 20s? Yeah. And uh, depending on who you read or listen to, they were maybe working on more shenanigans that year, too. <laughs> um <clears throat> And then in, in November, the uh, Major League owners deposed 
Major League Chairman Ban Johnson and unanim- unanimously replaced him with Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis in an effort to clean up the game. Landis was uh, awarded a $50,000 a year uh, salary by the major leagues, but they deducted his $7,500 judge's salary from it because he continued to sit as a federal judge while serving as chairman of Major League Baseball. Do they deduct anything from Manfred? Because they should. Ah, uh, if only. If only. <laughs> I feel like he should be paying someone. I feel like he's, he's paying got all of us. Or somebody's kid or somebody's yeah. wife or something. I don't know. <laughs> On the field, uh, Babe Ruth changed teams. In January, his contract was sold by the Boston Red Sox to the New York Yankees for $100,000. Babe Ruth would go on to tie the single season home run record at uh, which would just previously 29 on July 15th and break it the next day. He finished the season with a new record of 54 homers for the season. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And we Almost know he wasn't doubled. juicing unless juice was beer and hot dogs, right? Right. Yeah. Walter Johnson would record his 300th win for the Washington Senators on May 14th. The big train also recorded the only no hitter of his career with a one to nothing victory over the Boston Red Sox on July 1st. Other records this year would include the Yankees scoring 14 runs in the fifth inning of a 17 to nothing victory over the Senators on July 6th. Wow. The Tigers defeating the Yankees one to nothing in a 73 minute game, the American League's shortest ever game. I'm jealous of a 73 minute game. <laughs> Uh, it helps to not have commercial breaks. It, it does help to not have <laughs> right exactly. Uh, Trish Speaker would have an eleven hit, uh, eleven straight hit streak end on July tenth. The Cardinals set a record for consecutive hits by a team with twelve hits over two innings, uh, ten in the fourth and two in the fifth on September seventeenth. And the Pirates and Reds played. Whoa, whoa, whoa. First- I don't understand that record. Uh, it. Somebody must have gotten thrown out trying to steal or something like that. Oh, okay. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Like our, our stretching a single to a double. Okay, cool, cool. All right. All right. Yeah. You see how for a second it was like, what a really weird record. Yeah. It threw me at first too. Uh, the Pirates and Reds played the first and only triple header in major league history in October 2nd. The Pirates won the first two, 13 to four and seven to three. And the Reds won the third, six to nothing. And finally, George Sisler set a uh, the single single season record for hits with 257. That record would stand until 2004 when Ichiro Suzuki finally broke it. Wow! And I guess if you had to have a bro- uh, a record broken, probably by the best pure hitter to probably ever do it. Right. Seems good. Hey, I want to ask you real quick. Um, you know, on this episode, we're talking a little bit about COVID because you know it's mm-hmm. 2020 and everything's about COVID. Oh, and, yeah. I, and I want you to do your best to take your powder blue glasses off <laughs> as a twins fan, but you're also in the medical, you're a medical professional. You're in the yeah. industry, as they say, mm-hmm. um, no punishment to Clevenger, uh, and particularly Clevenger yeah. or police act. What are your thoughts on that? It pisses me off. I mean, police act, I mean, they should both be punished for sure. Right. Um, there, there should be some kind of league consequences for not following the protocols. Uh, otherwise, what's to keep somebody from doing this again? And right. um, Plesek at least got caught and or owned up to it, and they made him drive back home by himself. But Clevenger got on a plane with the other guys from his team. Including and, Carlos Carrasco, a leukemia survivor. Right, Exactly. Uh, some guy who, you know, he, he's putting it all on the line for his team this year uh, by playing. And it's just such um, blatant disregard and disrespect for your teammates. Uh, it's really uh, breathtakingly stupid. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, th- that's pretty much it. I mean, they're saying that, you know, these guys are going to have to own up to their teammates and all that, but you got to have some kind of fine or suspension or something. Cause 
you can't tell me that that's really going to deter other young, dumb guys from doing similar things. What about owning up to the other teams that maybe we're going to get in? I mean, that's the thing, right? It isn't just the 30 or so guys that they're going to have to own up to. Um, You know, we're obviously doing baseball in weird times. You just went through, you know, a hundred years of baseball as we prepare for our fun, fun week next week. Yeah. Uh, You think baseball is in a better spot? hundred years ago, or you think it's in a better spot now than it was a hundred years ago or, or um, I, I mean, cause it was two really complicated years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 1920 was a really transitional year in that um, we were really heading into the live ball era with, with Ruth changing the game the way he was um, and, and the changes to um, with the pitching rules. Uh, you, you started seeing batting averages, go up considerably and, and seeing a lot more home runs and things like that. Uh, not just from Ruth either. So it was really transformative from baseball in that respect. Um, one of the things I didn't get into was that one of the reasons why uh, things started changing with the, the ball and pitcher rules was that somebody got hit in the head with a pitch and died that year. Um and, you know, it was a, a sinker or a, a, a submarine thrown uh, spitball. Uh, Just got out so, of his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really hard to say. It depends on what you mean by better place. I, you know, it, they, they were still segregated back then. Um, you know, there were no free agents. Um, yeah, there was all kinds of horrible stuff that was going to happen then and for a long time after, after that. After that, so, yeah. Um, but there's a lot of dumb, bad stuff happening right now, too. <laughs> so so I, dumb. I'd like to, um, I'm really interested in history, but, you know, people like to ask, you know, when would you go back to it and all that? And I, I wouldn't ever like to go back in time at all. It's, uh, I, I, I like to, modern I might community. like to go five or six months in the future. Yeah. I like modern conveniences and medicine and, <laughs> and entertainment and I, I like being a modern human being. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, well, Andrew, you know, next week it is our hundredth anniversary. I just want to take a second to thank you so much for being an integral part of this show, man. We couldn't be doing it without you. Yeah. Th- thanks. It's been great to be involved and to get to know you and the other guys that do this show and, and uh, to grow my fanship for baseball uh, more through this process. It's been a lot of fun. Go, go Astros. Go, go Astros. A focus on H-Town Hardball. All right, so here with uh, Go, go Astros with Andy Tom Chesson. And we've got, you know, it's starting to look like maybe some good news. First, uh, you know, they took two or three from the Giants. And um, Yastrzemski, I don't ever have to see that guy play ball ever again. Uh, I mean, he doesn't play for the Astros, obviously, but... I like seeing young players and I like seeing young players starting to do well. And that's a guy in a market that's important to MLB um, that has obviously the lineage um, that you want to see do well. And and frankly, he looks like a hell of a hitter. So good for San Francisco. Um, I hope they can hold on to him in five years or whatever free agency looks like after the CBA. (laughs) After the CBA, if they, yeah. Um, I would think San Francisco would be able to. They they should be a big enough market, I would think, and they've had enough recent success. Um, yep. you, you know, so but, we're sitting here. Go ahead. But, you know, if he wants to play in Houston because he hits well in Minute Maid Park, I wouldn't turn it down. I wouldn't turn it down. I, I, I just always assume when someone's leaving, you mean New York. Right. Well, I mean, that's accurate. Or down the PCL to – or PCH, excuse me. Um, you know, so two or three against the Giants. Uh, they got a game back on Oakland – Division, is it a pie in the sky situation now, or, or do you think it's something that's really within the Astros' realistic grasp? Um, I think once, um, and it, it, you know, it never comes down to one player, but I think once Loriano actually has to serve his suspension, and I don't see it, you know, unlike Joe Kelly's suspension, I don't really see it be reduced for six games. Maybe he gets five games instead of six, but it's still going to be fairly significant for a 68 season. Um, I think that hurts them because they don't have a – the A's have a lot of depth. I don't think they have the outfield depth to necessarily cover his loss for 10% of the season. Um, 
So there's still a chance. The A's are obviously in the catbird seat. The Astros are obviously trailing. You hate to say you need a sweep, but with Seattle coming in Houston, into Houston this week, you really need a sweep. Um, that really helps um, and could put some things in a tighter position. Um, so again, like we said last week, let's talk, talk to me after this weekend and see how I feel about winning the division. Yeah, especially with a really suddenly really good Colorado Rockies team after them with four straight, right. uh, no more off days after today for 17 days, I think, which is yeah, nice for us stuff. as fans, but it sucks for the players. Um, let's talk, let's talk some bad news before we get in some good news. Yep. Um, you know, Altuve obviously is dealing with a lot. You think it's, you think it's mental. You think he, is he hurt? Um, what do you think is going on with him? Um, you know, last year when he had the slow start, it was very obvious that his legs weren't right. And so he went on the, I think the 10 day aisle at that point came back in like 15 days and kind of took off from there. I, I don't see, he's not acting hurt. But the concentration level um, that I think you have to have, especially when you are not as physically gifted as some of your peers, and so everything is effort. Um, if the concentration level is not there for whatever reason, the effort suffers. The hitting is concerning, but the inability to field balls cleanly and make throws to first, that's a lot more concerning. And to me, that feels like a guy who is just, to borrow parlance, um, gripping really, really tightly, um, trying to do anything. And I think you get into the mode when you're Jose Altuve and you're the former MVP and you've got all the baggage of a franchise on your shoulders right now that you're trying to hit a six-run home run at every at-bat. You're trying to make a web gym type of play every time you feel the ball. And I think he needs more than anything else. The rest of the team – to come around and start hitting the way they're supposed to so he can just be comfortable in his role rather than trying to lead the Astros out of the abyss. I don't think they're in the abyss yet, even though they're two games under right now. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, I, I think the rest of the team is feeling it for him. There was a double play ball that should have happened, I think, two nights ago. And Correa wasn't even on the relay throw. It was Altuve, but Correa sort of took the blame. You could see him you know, for maybe leading him off the bag a little much, but, but that should have been a play he makes every other year. Well, and I think Altuve is their captain. Um, and we talk about Springer being the heart of the team, and I think that's absolutely accurate. But historically, has as Altuve has gone, the team has gone. Uh, when he said an MVP season, we've won a World Series. Uh, so there's still hope. There's still, you know, 40, 38 games left. It's not, you know, the end of the world by any means or anything like that. But he's going to have to start producing. Um, I don't certainly don't want to see more of Albert Toro at second base. But on the other hand, he got a hit last night. So yeah, um, and so let's talk a little bit about the biggest hit in his Astros career, Toro, Justin Verlander. Uh, so the story is is that Verlander is going to try to give it a go. That he's apparently right. picking up a baseball this week or next week, excuse me. Um, do you feel like it's a McCuller situation where he just can't injure it anymore, or do you think the injury is not as bad as what we? I mean, what are you hearing? I guess. Um, what I'm hearing is that he is relatively positive. He followed the doctor's orders or team doctor's orders and basically shut it down for two weeks. And so that means realistically, he's picking up the ball sometime this weekend and going to see where he's at. Um, I don't think, you know, anything until he actually starts throwing. Um, so I don't, anybody who's claiming to have news or insight, I think is guessing and hoping they're right. Um, if he throws, you have to rely on him to be honest enough to, um, say what's actually happening if the tightness is still there. Um, I think the good news is we'll back up a little bit. The MRI didn't reveal anything um, Corn, that right. would, that would have said, okay, this is definitely Tommy John surgery right now. Um, he also has the arm of a 37 year old, though. I mean, and so pitching a baseball is one of the un- most unnatural things you can do in professional sports or in life in general. Um, so. To say there's no damage in his arm, well, that's just silly because everybody who pitches for 25 years of their life (laughs) probably has damage. Um, It's just a matter of how effective he can be. And I don't think he's the kind of guy that wants to go out there and only be able to give 75%. Um, And I think he realizes that it would damage the team more than than not if you tried to do that. And honestly, starting pitching hasn't been the Astros' issue the last couple of weeks. Um, so if there's a spot, if it comes down to his health and pitching next year, 
or trying to make some futile attempt to win the division this year, just to say we won the division for four years in a row, I don't see the point of bringing him back. But if he's able to pitch, he's a welcome addition. And that shifts somebody else to a bullpen that could absolutely need some veteran help. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of agree. And it seems like, too, you know, if he's only able to give you one turn through the order, you know, mm-hmm. if, if if it is a McCullough situation in 18, I don't want to do it. If he really isn't that injured, like I feel like if Osuna comes back, it's a McCullough situation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm not hurting it anymore. Yeah. Um, Jordan coming back. So, so interesting question to pose to you. Jordan's coming back. Your kitties are uh, now throwing off of, off of the hill. Um, so is Brad Peacock. Unfortunately, so is Devo. Of those four coming back, Devo, P- Peacock, your Kitty, and Jordan, which of those four players, if you can only take one, is going to be the biggest sort of bellwether to future success? Is this even a question? It's Jordan Alvarez. It is the rookie of the year who hit 28 home runs and like 50 at bats last year. Well, uh, hold on now a second. Now, now, first of all, you, you want to get smart assy about it. I mean, at the end of the day, he's joining an offense that's still top five versus pitching help. I would say, but they're not top five anymore. This last, I, I, I did not look today, but before oh, the as Giants of yesterday, series, they were still top five in run scored. And they've had a hell of a rebound because before the Giants series, they had dropped down to 17 in average and 16th in OPS in all of baseball. Um, that's from being at the top. And, and that shows you, again, we've only played a few games. Right. But the season is only a few games. Um, the biggest issue for the Astros has been the bullpen, but the bullpen is a big issue because we haven't been hitting. If you have a 10 run lead going into the ninth, does it matter what your bullpen looks like? It did blow a six run lead two nights ago. Um, And, you know, thank God for Josh James. He warmed up and and good for him. Last night, he threw some pitches, didn't walk anybody, (laughs) got paid, didn't blow a lead. That's a successful night for Josh James. Good for him. Good for him. I mean, you know, um, he, did, he did that all in the bullpen, but that's great. Uh, great. Back, yeah, back to your question. Alvarez brings a solidifying force in the middle of a lineup that definitely needs a solidifying force. Um, because of injuries, because of underperformance, uh, Baker has been forced to shuffle the lineup. I think we've been pleasantly surprised with Reddick's output in the two yeah. hole. But long term, this team needs Springer, Altuve, uh, Brantley or Bregman, depending on how you feel about a particular matchup as your top three. If you can slot Alvarez in as a full-time DH in your four or five spot, that makes your six, seven, and eight that much better. Um, and that's been the secret to the Astro success is having superior talent, obviously, but pitchers don't get a break in that lineup. And right now they've got a few breaks. Um, and Alvarez removes one of those. Uh, should should Kitty, Correa be hitting higher in the lineup? I, I would think yes, uh, especially since um, Brantley has kind of fallen off a cliff the last few games. Oh, because he's, he's injured hurt. because some yeah, he's, yeah. he's hurt and he, he's being forced to play because nobody else is hitting. But he's not hitting because he's hurt. So it's six and one half dozen another. Um, ideally, I would like to see uh, Correa moved up to fifth. Had it batting behind Alvarez, but I think you could make a really interesting conversation about putting uh, Correa at cleanup and putting Alvarez fifth. So Correa has the protection between Bregman and him and putting Brantley down at six while he's still working things out and not having to carry the world. I think the other thing that's interesting is that Dusty needs to start understanding that with the rules of pitching as the way they are, you've got to start splitting up your left-handers, left-handed hitters a little bit better than he does. You can't stack them all at seven, eight, and nine and go, oh, makes, I, <laughs> I don't understand why they're pitching the way they are. <laughs> he has made it easy for other teams to navigate the three batter minimum. Absolutely. Really and so I think that's one of the good things about having Reddick up at two. Um, again, that's not a long-term solution. But if you can put Alvarez in, surround him with two right-handers, then put Brantley on the front or the back of that, um, that helps – with making the other team make decisions um, and potentially putting their relief pitchers in bad situations. Okay. Uh, two final questions then um, looking at Zach Grinky last night, famously yelling his pitches uh, and maybe somehow exonerating the Astros of the size stealing sandal. They say, Hey, even when you do know you're coming, have you ever seen anything like that in baseball? I would tell you um, one of the things, and it's a, it's a cliche for sure. But uh, one of the, my favorite things in um, 
the uh, baseball documentary that Ken Burns did was listening to Buck O'Neill talk about how every time you think you've seen everything, something new comes along. I'm in a good mood today because of Zach Brinke last night. <laughs> that was an outstanding thing that I would say no one's ever seen before. The man literally called out his pitch and not in a quiet way and not with signals and not behind a glove or throwing fingers or anything like that. He just literally said, I'm throwing the number two pitch now. <laughs> and then he did it. And then the guy popped up and it was fantastic. And then he giggled. He literally giggled all the way off the mound. Yeah. Yeah. Great. The next I think, um, I think that there was this sort of when Cole left and backlash on the Grinky K, Grinky trade that I think was a little unfair. And I think that this team is going to adopt a little bit of his not given, not given a fuck about anything. Um, yeah. Well, I think the other thing is that when Verlander, and I don't want to, you know, pick on Justin Verlander because I hope this is not accurate, but typically when a power pitcher ages, they age really quickly um, because they just can't throw fastballs anymore. Grinky's past that point. He can't throw a fastball more than 92 miles an hour uh, with a hurricane behind him. Uh, but he knows how to pitch. Mm -hmm. And you don't stop being able to throw curveballs. You don't stop being able to throw sliders. And more importantly, you don't stop being able to know how to work a batter's head. The Giants hitters, even though they're a young team, they've had years of seeing Grinky. If anybody should know how to hit him, it should be the Giants and the Dodgers and the Padres. And he dominated them last night. Um, you know, conceivably, if his wind was a little bit better, he probably could have gone into the seventh inning. But as it is, um, he had a fantastic outing. Uh, he certainly has alleviated the concerns and given us, a, a, you know, at least a hope in the rotation. Um, and McCullers did as well in his last start. Yeah. I want to give him, um, you know, some praise for that. You've got to have guys in your rotation that you can count on. Um, for all the good that um, – Belak has brought, he's still an unknown. You still don't know what you're going to get day to day. Um, you've got to have three of those guys that you can count on every time. We have two. Yeah. Guys. And I would say the thing about Belak and Christian Javier and even Valdez is yeah. that looks, that makes me feel really good about 2023. Yes. I, but 2020 and 2021, I want Verlander, McCullers, and Granke taking the ball every, every fifth day. Absolutely. Um, all right. So let's go. Um, Real quick, you know, I think a lot of people have flipped the script on how they feel about Carlos Correa. I think it began uh -huh. in spring training where um, he was the only person to not go quietly into the, into the into the night when it came to the sign stealing thing. And now he's backed it up. Um, if you can extend one person, if you can extend Springer or extend Correa and you're the GM, who do you extend? So my answer into this in previous years has been George Springer um, and Honestly, it's because Springer doesn't have the likability issue that Correa has had in his past. And Correa, to be fair, the last two seasons has had some kind of interesting injuries, especially last year uh, yeah. with the massage and the broken rib. Um, if you don't get massages in the wrong places, you don't get broken ribs. But that's neither here nor there. Um, the long-term concern with Correa is his back. If he can somehow overcome that and not be, you know, limited to 100 games a year, which is what he's averaged for the past three, um, he's a no-brainer. I think the leadership and the ability to perform, um, even down in the order with no protection, uh, is certainly solidified. And just overall, if you take the personalities completely out of it, a plus-plus shortstop is more valuable to you than a plus-plus right fielder. It is easier to replace a good hitting outfielder than it is to replace a good hitting shortstop. And so you've got great uh, superior offense at a premium defensive position. That's always the guy. Um, and if the personality piece can be overlooked and um, honestly, if Correa has grown up, which it appears he has, that kind of makes that a no brainer for me. Having said that, I'd love them to extend George and then figure it out. And now, the Big League Chew. An eye on the majors. Brought to you by Zoomer Sport. All right, we are back with our Major League Baseball expert, um, Scott McIntyre, who is dressed as the Cardinals, hoping someday they'll play again. I like it's a Hawaiian shirt because they're, pra they're practically on vacation right now anyway, right? Well, that's kind of how it feels. That's kind of how it feels. And with the Blues losing also the, the first game against Vancouver, it's uh, in every game in the round robin. It's, it's kind of... 
yeah, little little ner- feeling a little twitchy. I did time. watch that the other right. night and did not bring it up on purpose. I also don't want to bring it up. Yeah. I'm a new blues fan. How much I like the Las Vegas uniforms and logo. Oh, my, my 20 year old who is a diehard blues fan. He loves the Vegas uniforms. Of course, also when the Kraken stuff came out, yeah. he was crazy about that too. As I've pointed out to him, when the blues were formed in 1967, the blue on blue on blue looked pretty cool too then with the red and yellow. So, but it's just been around for 50 something years. Yeah, no, you're right. It doesn't look as cool now. Well, we'll, we'll get into some blues talk uh, this weekend over a couple of beers and we'll, we'll hopefully, uh, I won't, you won't kick me out of the fan base, but you know, um, Scott, (laughs) and I'm going to, I'm going to provide a little bit of vague background to you. So you are in a very serious relationship with a woman whose job it is to essentially, um, look at things that cause risk and plan for risk. And of course, the big thing with risk is COVID. And we're also living in a world in which people deny that this is an issue. Um, what do you think about this whole uh, Mike Clevenger situation out of Cleveland? Oh, man. Um, well, let's just open that can of worms up. So first of all, um, coming from, like as you talked about, uh, she has chief data scientist behind her name for a reason. And as you and I discussed with her, you know, this is a very serious situation. We haven't even seen wave two once things mutate and things get really bad. So maybe that could be coming around. Mike Clevenger, where do we start? Um, I guess everybody knows by now that Mike Clevenger and Zach Plezak went out on the town in Chicago after they beat the White Sox. Mike, uh, it looks like Plezak had friends there. Clevenger joined. Uh, Please, I told the team the next morning, hey, I went out last night. Really, really dumb. They sent him home in a rental car, which I'm learning he may not have had to drive himself. He should have been forced to drive and it should have been an economy car. I mean, it should have been like, what's Here's the biggest piece of crap Sonata. car you got on your market? Yeah. yeah. Hey, 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 hey. I like that. Um, I'm thinking more like a Ford Fiesta with like 180,000 miles. May make it back, may not. Let's find I love out. It. Um, so, Please act does that. Clevenger, <laughs> Clevenger then flies with the team, goes through a team meeting, hangs out with the coaches. And then Monday afternoon, the team learns, oh, you were out with them too. Now, and mind you, he's been around a guy, uh, Carlos Carrasco, who's just coming back from leukemia. Yep. He's got a manager due back that day from hospitalization for gastrointestinal problems, who's also I at risk. I didn't know that part. For, Francona was gone. Francona was just coming back to the team. Um, and then Tuesday night, so they, you know, obviously, Mike, you're gone. Clevenger's off now. Uh, after also having sat through a team meeting where they were explaining what was going on with Plezak, and he defended Plezak's actions. So you, this, this is like you and I. We went out for a night on the town whenever we weren't supposed to. We come back. We're sitting there. Um, with our significant others and all their friends and they're around and we're saying, yeah, yeah, Jim, we're, I, you know, you're caught, right? You're busted. And me saying, man, Jim really shouldn't have gone out to that strip club. That was really bad. That was really bad. Meanwhile, I was the guy slipping you twenties. So, uh, and, and I'm not admitting it. That's really who Clevenger is. I have, I, I have, I've read so many quotes from guys inside the, the, the guy who started for him, Plutko is, is that his name? Who started yeah, for Clevenger yeah. Tuesday night? because they sent Clevenger home. He is livid. He went four innings with one earned run. Good outing. But you can see in his post-game talk, he's livid with this guy. Like, we can't trust him. How in the world do you trust this guy? That's my problem with Clevenger. Please, like, you're a dummy. Please, like, just a dummy, right? But Clevenger had time to think about the right thing to do and, and willingly went against doing the right thing so he could do the wrong thing. Furthermore, now this is where it gets really bad. Both of the guys had made comments back in July of how much you have to put your teammates on a pedestal and suck it up that this isn't, you know, this is, this is the, you gotta be a big boy and things like that. And then the first time they have the opportunity to get around friends in Chicago, they go out for the night. You please, that gets back and, 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 um, the teammates are going to have a little stern talking to. I'm pretty sure both of you got, these guys are kicking themselves in the head, but please, I did it first. Please, I admitted is wrong. It's always the cover up that gets you. Right. If anyone, whether it's American politics, whether it's sports, no matter what it is, the cover up is what gets you. Um, and, and for, for me, I think that, um, I, I, 
I don't know if I could play on the same team with Mike Clevenger. Well, let's, let's talk so about that because it Indian. isn't just uh, Pluko uh, who had comments. I think it was Lindor. Correct. And very, yep. and he's a team leader. Um, and how, Frank, Francona as well. Francona as well has, has come out and said, you know, he's got a you, locker, from, locker room full of people that don't trust him. At what point do we say, like, because you can see this being lip service and they're like, well, he's a good pitcher. We want to win, blah, blah, blah. But it, this seems like bigger fish to fry with an organization that, frankly, has already put itself under the microscope with the Indians moniker thing. Um, how, how, much, how much can you play with this guy? I, I don't I honestly don't think you can. Um, so I, I know both you and I are wondering, well, why didn't Major League Baseball do something? And and I don't know enough about the Major League Baseball players agreement to know if they can. The protocols that were issued, as we all know, is like document this stick and they're really kind of loose. They're all over the place. So yeah. did he break a protocol? Yes. It, does that protocol, is it specifically listed and does it, um, is there punishment listed that Major League Baseball can dole out for breaking that protocol? I, I think that the only thing at Manfred's disposal is the nuclear option of shutting down the whole season because of this guy. I just don't understand how it's you can so watch what Major the Cardinals League are baseball, going through. Right? Like, it's so Major League uh, it would, I mean, it would fit. have steps. You know, like, yeah, like I mean, especially yeah. whenever, you know, they, they, well, I mean, let's face it, Jim, they only had like 18 weeks to figure this out. Um, you know, so why do anything in the first 17, just slam it all together in the last <laughs> few days. Um, but if, after you've watched what the Cardinals have gone through and still gone through, can you believe when was the last time that um, there was a major league baseball team that had not played a game for two weeks while everybody else was playing? I don't know. If, I don't know if this has ever happened. It's ever happened. Um, I don't, I don't think it does. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, we're five games behind the Cubs in the central we've played five games. So you you tell me it's weird. Um, weird, but I, I I don't, well, do you, I don't know how you think the Indians can come back from this. I think the, did the Indians have a responsibility to now discipline Clevenger for breaking tools? Sorry. Give us one second of quiet. At a point. Do the Indians now have a responsibility, do you think? Because, again, there's a public face to this with how people are dying of this virus. Do they have a responsibility to discipline Clevenger more than putting him on the restricted list with pay? I don't know if the Indians can do anything publicly with Clevenger. I know they will do something in-house. We may never fully know what it is. I think his job is at risk as well. And I don't know who in the world wants to pick this guy up. Now, the Indians... Being a franchise in a small market, this is a guy that makes like half a million a year, I think, and he's shown himself to be a, a good pitcher. So on the business side, I really want to uh, fix this guy. You know, I want to fix things in the clubhouse. It's in my bottom line best interest to fix it. However, I don't know how he fixes it. He's going to have to do a lot. Um, my, I was talking to a friend when this broke, and I told him that night that if I was playing in the infield for him in his next start and they hit a ground ball to me, I wouldn't move. I'd let it go right on by and I would have it that way for the first three batters. He's going to give up three inside the park home runs to the first three people that put the ball in play pop up. He better catch it himself because I'm not, I'm not going to move for him. I think that sends a message very strongly to the public to say that, okay, well, we can't say what we're doing. It's kind of obvious how, how his teammates feel. I think it also dishes out something to him. So you want to do that to us. We'll do that to you. That may seem petty, but man, going out in Chicago uh, in the middle of a pandemic when you're supposed to be in a bubble is pretty damn p- petty in my book. Okay, so, so let me ask you this that, then, and I know we got to wrap up. But um, does publishing him private, punishing him privately in a pandemic, do we miss an opportunity to really sh- teach a lesson to the rest of the country that this is serious? And does that matter? Is that up to the Indians to do that? Yeah, no. I mean, do you miss the opportunity? Yes, of course. Can you do that? And what precedent does that set? Um, I I don't know if I I think Major League Baseball has to be the one. Their punishments dished out all the time inside Clubhouse that you and I don't know a thing about. Um, This is just a really big one that that went public. He issued uh, an apology that seems really empty because he didn't do it when he had the first opportunity and he didn't call himself out. I, this this is something that doesn't leave this guy. It it goes with him from clubhouse to clubhouse for the rest of his career, and and I don't know how he um 
I don't know how, how he gets past it. I don't know if any public thing can be done that would ever take the monkey off this guy's back. I think if Mike Clevenger wants this to clear off of Mike Clevenger, and Zach Plezak as well, you own, you own something for this. If these were the first guys that did this, it would be different as well. But the Marlins and the Cardinals have already shown what can happen to the entire team. And furthermore, really quick, I got to throw this in because we were talking about the data uh, and the science behind this early. They say you got to go four or three days worth of tests, two rounds of testing. But the Cardinals, Lane Thomas, who was roommates with Ryan Helsley, Helsley, when Helsley was diagnosed with the disease, they put him to the side. Lane Thomas went through three tests. It was the fourth test. It was six days after the fact when Helsley had left the team that Lane Thomas tested positive and they were roommates. So they knew he was at risk, but he kept showing up negative, but they kept him away from everyone else. And then finally he showed up positive six days later. So first of all, this oh, three days on the restricted list and all is well, bull crap. Uh, the, the 14 days, if, if he was going to another country, it'd be a 14 day quarantine. My opinion is should have 14 days without pay sitting in a quarantine. Uh, but anyway, um, back to the subject. I, I think that there's, Clevenger has to take acts of contrition. What does that mean? Does that mean working at a homeless shelter and masking up? Does that mean doing a PSA? I don't know, but he's got to do something to, to get that team back on his side. Cause there's no way. I, play a, with that bitch. I obviously have a personal ax to ground with Clevenger because when the Astro stuff broke, he was very integrity of the game stuff. But oh, yet he, yeah. You know, so, you know, so the, the, I'm trying to put my head about this and, and I honestly hope for his sake, I, and I mean this truly, I hope he didn't get anybody sick, especially Carrasco, because he'll never, he will never live with himself if he gets, if he infected a teammate being stupid. So I, I hope he doesn't have that. But Scott, we have some good news. Uh, real quick, what are you looking forward to about Saturday and your first trip to what I think is the best independent ballpark out there? The 100 degree heat. Show me the merch, the best from the pro shop. And welcome back to another segment of Show Me the Merch. Now, like everyone in America, I assume everyone, but like most people in America, you are watching Shark Week this week. It's been a great week so far. I thought the Will Smith episode was great. But anyway, it's Shark Week. So it might as well be Shark Week on Let's Get To. So in our next segment, we're going to talk to the general manager of the Martha's Vineyard Sharks. But first, we're going to look at some really great gear from the team and what was kind of neat, and, and I've said this before, you know, a lot of these teams, minor league baseball teams, collegiate summer league, indie teams, you know, they just need people to discover the brand, right? Like these brands are mostly great. And if people find out about them, they like them. The problem is, is getting people to find out. And so what I thought was really neat is, is the general manager, when I ordered some stuff, threw in a, a, a bunch of extra stuff that... It's got me tickled. We're already planning a trip out there next year. So I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I ordered and some of the stuff they threw in because, again, it's perfect for Shark Week. Now, we're going to start with the Flex Fit hat. I went Flex Fit because, again, I'm a big fan of a hat that I, looks like I pulled it out of my back pocket and I'm going to wear it to a ballpark. And I love the logo, the shark biting the bat. And what I really like is the color scheme. The black and purple really work great together. It's really diving into, pun intended, that that look of the shark that falls in line with Martha's Vineyard where Jaws was shot. Now, they also threw in some fun knickknacks. They threw in a really cool koozie, a lanyard that I will use, a clapper, which is lots of fun, all branded, a bucket hat, which, again, I'll actually use this out at the beach, a cool bag that will become part of what I use on location covering teams for the show. And then this is what I ordered first, which is the game worn Jersey. Again, the black really pops with the purple. The logo is great. And I like that on the back rather than a player name or a sponsor. It says Martha's Vineyard, the hometown of the team. Now, there were a couple of other things that they did drop in that, again, super classy move. Now, obviously, they dropped in the 2019 pocket schedule, the last time they've actually had games. But they actually inc included, for me, a general admission ticket. 
uh, two of them. So that way we know we're covered next year when we go up there. And then they gave us an official program. But one of the f- most fun things to be in the box was my very own officially branded Martha's Vineyard Sharks beach ball. Uh, we'll keep this floating around the office. Anytime I need to work out some stress, I'll just beach beach ball this thing away. So again, check out the Martha's Vineyard Char- Sharks. Um, their, their new Facebook shop is where I bought the stuff and it works great. Uh, they are very, very responsive if you have any questions. And again, it just a, like some really, really great branded material from one of the best looking brands. And, and again, it's right up my alley. Uh, it is Shark Week, which is why we pushed them to this week. And, um, I'm a big jaws guy, so it all really fit perfectly. And, you know, I cannot wait to get out to Martha's Vineyard. It's always been super high on my, my travel list and it got a little bit higher because now I get to see some really, really good baseball from a really great brand. And like I said, next segment, you're going to get to learn all you need to know about the Martha's Vineyard Sharks. Who's on first? The let's get to local nine. Brought to you by Zoomer Sport. So we are excited to welcome to our on deck segment Russ Curran. He is the president and general manager of the Martha's Vineyard Sharks, which gotta be honest, one of my favorite loose connections. I'm a big Jaws guy, so I, I can't help but love that connection. Russ, how you doing today? Good. How you guys doing? It's a uh, shock week too, so perfect. It's it's, perfect it's shark week. It's it's everything. Yeah. Um. When we are coming up there next year and we're going to also do a little Jaws tour while we're up there to see you guys. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you end up getting into baseball in the first place and becoming the president and general manager of a collegiate wood bat team? Uh, I mean, baseball started way back when, when my son was, uh, you know, five or six years old and he was a big lefty and he wanted to play baseball. So I started out by being the president of a little league in Lakeville, Mass at the old Ted Williams camp that a lot of people in this country have traveled to over the years. Um, did that for like three or four years. And then uh, started my own AAU program called Shamrocks Baseball. So I had five or six teams doing that for a few years and we went all over the place and played. And um, it got to a point where baseball was, you know, good to my family, good to me. And my son was really good at it, so he got a chance to play college ball, and he got a chance to play with the Sharks, and that's how I ended up heading out there to watch him and helped out that organization and ended up becoming the general manager and president. So talk to me a little bit about then the Sharks and y'all's league. How important is it to that community? I know like the Cape Cod League is huge up in that part of the country as well. What does that team mean to the community? I mean, it, it means a lot just because it's like, affordable, friendly family entertainment. I mean, you can go out here, you can pay 10 bucks, sit down, watch a baseball game, get a cheeseburger and a hot dog for $10. Where you're not going to do that too many places on the island. You know, so it's like, we get a lot of people, a lot of visitors, uh, vacationers come out. Um, Everybody always says, well, how come you don't get a lot of local people out? Well, it's kind of tough because this is when the locals make their money during the summertime. So these guys are working, you know, till seven, eight o'clock at night. They don't have a chance to get out, but I mean, it means a lot. We get a lot of the local kids that come out and watch the games and um, aspire to be shocked someday, you know, and so on and so forth. But I mean, as far as the community goes, people miss it this year. It's unbelievable. It's like everybody comes out. I was like, well, hope you guys are back next year. I'm like, yeah, so do I. You know. Well, we'll talk about that this year. Like at what point did you guys make the decision or the realization that it just wasn't going to happen? Well, we had a conference call on May 1st with the entire league and uh, that's when it all happened. I mean, I was always on the mindset, you know, maybe we can make this happen somehow. Um, if we, if we push it back, push it back, you know, to July 1st and just try and get a month season in just to have something. Um, it just didn't, the cards weren't there. I mean, in the long run, I probably would have had trouble with my biggest issue I have is host families because a lot of the host families were scared of the COVID. Um, my bigger host families, one people take six, one take five, and they both backed out prior to May 1st saying, you know, we just don't think it's safe for us to take kids this year. And 
so on and so forth. So, um, so May 1st was a, a bad, a dark day for baseball on the island, for sure. I, I guess that is a good point, though. That's the part of it that I didn't even think about that. Yeah, you, you guys have host families. So it isn't just isolating players so you can play ball, but it's keeping a whole other subset of families safe as well. It really is a more complicated issue. Correct. You know, and then the guidelines weren't really in place by then that they have now. If they're traveling from another state, they got a quarantine. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they were in place, we had a plan that, okay, we're going to start June 7th. We're going to get the kids out May 15th into their homes, get, you know, do their quarantine, get everything we need to do and so on and so forth. And then, you know, get ready to play the season on June 7th or June 6th. Um, it just it didn't work out. That's all. And you said you've heard a lot from the community just that they are missing it this year. Um, what does next year look like for you guys? I mean, it all depends on the country. I mean, you see everything going on today. The Big Ten's canceling all fall sports today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's. I, I guess the only way we're going to be moving forward is if there's a vaccine, in my opinion. We were supposed to host the All-Star game next year. Um, we had the, It hasn't even been discussed officially, but I discussed it, and I said, we really will pass and go with 2022 with the hopes that everything will be completely clear by then, you know, so we don't have any restrictions on how many fans we can have and so on and so forth. Yeah, we're going to, um, yeah, that's the, that's obviously the best case scenario, right? Is hopefully we get a vaccine sooner than later. Cause you're exactly right. As we're, as we're talking, big 10 is shut down. Big 12 is expected to announce this week. I suspect the sec will probably hold out the longest, but they'll probably cancel too. Yeah, I mean, I saw something today. The Power Five conferences don't see how they can play fall sports, so right. that includes a lot. And of course, if they push, that could affect you guys in, with with getting players and and all that stuff going forward. Um, when you when 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 we're, ever, when we're able to go out to the ballpark and you're able to get fans out, what is that experience like? Like, why do you think um, fans like coming out to your ball games? I mean, you can walk, you walk into the park and people don't even believe our park is on the island. They're like, holy crap, because I mean, we've done a lot over the years. We've put split, split rail fencing in. So now you come into an entrance and you got to walk in from center field. So you get to take everything in. We put new bathrooms in. We have a new concession trailer. Um, and the kids can walk right up to the players in the bullpen and talk to them. It's not like, you know, you're not caged so you can't get to anybody. Yeah, and, and we emphasize doing stuff with the community, you know, go out and talk to the kids. I mean, our coach is so adamant about if any kid ever comes up to you for an autograph, unless you're at bat, <laughs> you give the kid an autograph, you know. So that's what they're all about. I mean, it's all about the community and reaching out to our fans. I mean, and we've been pretty good the last couple of years. We won the championship in the other league in 2018. Last year, we we're the best team in the league all year and lost in the finals. And that was our first year in that league. And we, yeah. didn't get, we didn't get into the league until January 21st or something like that. So now you look at everybody else been recruiting since September. So we started in January quote, but I mean, we were pretty set on who we thought we were going to have. And we right. just picked up some pieces after we officially got in the league that we didn't think we'd have. I mean, we got one kid in and we went on a 14 game winning streak as soon as he got here. You know, it wasn't all him, but it was just shored up a lot of things and sure. pushed a lot of people to, you know, play better. And um, it's just, it's a family fun, inexpensive way to spend a, a night at the ballpark. And we have games in between innings like all the other minor league teams do. And we have a lot of giveaways. You mentioned kids and it's, it's a really interesting position you're in being a collegiate wood bat team because you're training the kids of Martha's Vineyard to be baseball baseball fans while you're also helping the collegiate players grow to be eventual pros. How cool is that transition for you guys? And is that a big part of why you do what you do? I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, my son, he started out here in like 2014 and started doing lessons with a kid. So now the kids, he started when he was eight. So now the kid's 14 years old and uh, he plays on an off island team, but he still comes back my son all the time for lessons because he just been successful by working with him, you know? So even though he pays for an AAU team off Island with coaches, Mm -hmm. he's still 
like he wants to he wants to be a shock someday and he's he wants to learn from the shocks and you know that's that's what we had this morning we have drop-in clinics and we've been averaging you know 10 to 18 kids per day for drop-in clinics um the kids come out they have fun they want to be hanging around the players they want to get autographs um it's it's all about the community i mean we there's a thing called camp jabberwocky out here it's a camp for underprivileged kid um not underprivileged um special needs kids uh-huh. we, we spend as much time as possible when they call for us to go have lunch with them, when they come to the games, they come to the games twice, three times a year. Um, our players go over and just interact with them and spend time with them. Um, and as much as we can with every every group that comes, when the Little League comes, when the hockey pro- program comes, you know, anybody that comes as a group, the players interact. And, you know, this, you try and explain it, explain the kids, like, you're rock stars out here. You don't realize it, but you are rock stars. And I still remember we we lost in the playoffs and we're leaving the island before I was in charge. My son's last year and we're at the store and some little girl comes up, comes up to the window and says, can I have your autograph? He was like, whoa. You know, he's like, we're leaving. And this girl recognized me from being a shock and said, you know, can I have your autograph? And Obviously, he jumped right out there and gave her, you know, gave his autograph and took pictures with her and stuff. So it's, you know, it's pretty cool. And what about the players that move on, that do move on in their career, that play college, that play pro? How many, like, do they stay connected? Do they stay connected with host families? How important is all of that for you guys? Oh, it's very important. We just had a kid this last, well, this last spring before all this craziness happened. He got married on the island at his host family's house. So they do stay connected. I mean, one of the coaches I brought in last year in the middle of the season because we lost our hitting coach was a former shock and his host mom is still hosting kids. So he still talks to her all the time. So the kids still do interact. Um, my son talks to his whole family whenever he gets a chance, you know, whenever he sees him, he goes to, goes to the house Christmas time and stuff still just to visit him. And um, so it's really, really, that's the biggest thing is to, you know, it's, we don't call them, we don't call them um, host players. We call them summer sons. So oh, I love that. You know, I love so, that, Russ. You know, you you get in the summer sun. It's it's hard though. It's it's hard to get host families out here, only because of the demographics. Where if you have an empty bed out here, you can rent it to somebody for three or four hundred dollars a week in the summertime. Oh yeah. As opposed to we don't pay our host families. You know, we don't give them anything. Um, we try and give them gift packs at the end of the year where they get gift cards to island restaurants and grocery stores and so on and so forth, you know, as a thank you and a help, you know, and we try and help them out. Um, but it's just, that's, a, that's our biggest, biggest feat is to try and get host families. It's hard. Well, I hope that your A's are able to, I, uh, I really hope that we get everything back to normal before the season kicks off next summer. Cause I know my wife and I are real excited to get out there, but thanks so much for us for being on let's get to and, and for just uh, doing what you guys do. It's real important. Thank you. I appreciate it. Go shocks. And now on to close it out, the right-hander from Houston, Texas, James Christopher. So as we wrap it up, I am going to share two kind of fun stories about the Houston Astros, mostly because they really won't get covered uh, because it's something not, you know, egregious about the Houston Astros. It's not them basically being, um, you know, Hans Gruber, which is the only stories about that team. But I want to do a shout out to new Astros pitch, pitcher Brooks Raley. Now, Brooks is a Houstonian. I uh, went to a and Gigum Aggies for Andy Tom Cheston and all our Aggie friends out there. And he, um, you know, basically was traded to be a guy in the bullpen and have pitched his, he pitched Tuesday night, pitched well, pitched last night, pitched well, and doesn't really know Dusty Baker yet and thought he was going back out for the eighth inning. And Dusty Baker his unwritten rules, if he if he daps you up, if he gives you knuckles, as he said, because he's not young, um, then that means you're out of the game. Well, he didn't know that. And so Josh James came in, 
Brooks Raley was already on the mound. He was like the first one out of the dugout on the mound. And the rules, it has nothing to do with the three batter rule. That's what was going on on Twitter. Oh, he has to pitch the beginning of the eighth. The three batter rule only applies within the context of one inning. If you finish the inning, the, the rule no longer applies. But he was out there. And because I guess the inning had technically started and he was the first one on the mound, he was required to throw at least one pitch or at least throw face one batter. And so, uh, he did, he ended up f- finishing the, the inning off and ended up having an appearance of an inning in two thirds, uh, pitched well. Astros won. Astros Twitter kind of honestly got a little sarcastic because they said he also prevented Josh James from pitching, which makes him the real hero. I think Josh will get his, 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 uh, Josh will get his uh, his stuff back. But no, I thought it was sort of a cute, fun story and uh, kind of it's one of those weird kind of things in baseball that you don't ever really I never really thought of. And and it also just goes to show you the flux of how a lot of these teams are with all these injuries that they are just, you know, they're seeing players that have never, you know, they've never met their manager and they don't know how the teams work. And it's an interesting social experiment, if anything else, to look at where baseball is due to um, COVID-19 and and the injuries as a result of the quick ramp up after COVID-19. But that is our show. Uh, this weekend, we're going to be back out at the Constellation Energy League. Scott McIntyre, Timothy and I are going to be together again to watch a ball game and it's Jimmy Buffett night. And I have an amazing outfit picked out. And then next week, we're going to have we're going to be celebrating our hundredth anniversary or hundredth episode, excuse me. And we are going to essentially have three 100th episodes because I put out a call to some of our favorite guests from the first two years of this show and got a hundred percent response rate, which I was not used to. So we're going to let everybody come on. Some of your favorite guests from the past, some of our let's get to awards will be announced. We are tickled to death and can't wait. So enjoy your weekend. I hope all your teams do well. If you live near Joliet or Bismarck or Sugarland, get out to a ball game. Just take three hours to forget about all of the ugliness of the world. So until next time, until Monday, let's get to it.